About two months ago on March 8th, Steve Jones and I had the opportunity to preach a sermon on the dangers of a hurried life. Steve was at our North Katy campus and I was at our central campus. And it was the first Sunday of spring break week. So crowds naturally were a little thin as our families were enjoying some time away together. Our kids all in the Katy Houston area were excited to get a week off from school. Life was pretty normal. But then three days later, Three days later, an announcement was made that seemed to sort of change everything. That Wednesday, the announcement was made that the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo was canceled. Then later, we heard about basketball games and tournaments and other events also canceled as emergency health declarations were made at the local, state, and national level. Our kids who left for what they thought was one week away from school would never step back on their campus this academic year. And our lives have changed a lot in a short amount of time. If you think about it, we actually have a new vocabulary. Now words like social distance, community spread, flatten the curve and quarantine have become part of our everyday language. And to the degree and the duration that these changes are gonna impact us is right now, we don't know. But here's what we do know. In the midst of all of this, we have slowed down. We've been forced to. Maybe perhaps a a benefit of of this terrible, terrible disaster is that for a lot of us is we've been freed from the prison of our busy lives. And friends, this is something that we must remember. So today we're doing something that, that we haven't done before is Pastor Ryan has asked me to preach a message very similar, almost exactly the same that I did eight weeks ago. You see, because as a pastoral staff is, we quite often wrestle with the timing of messages. Yes, God's word is eternal. It's never changing. But what we also know is that God's word, it impacts all of us differently at different times. So today in the midst of times that are a little more uncertain, in the midst of times that you may have a little more free time. Let's examine again the dangers of a hurried life. Let's pray. God, today as we open your word, our prayer is that you would also open our eyes, our ears, and our heart into the things you would have us to see and hear and feel today. God, would you change lives like only you can do? In Jesus' name. Amen. In his book, The Me I Want to Be, is pastor and author John Ortberg. He shares a story about a conversation that he had with his mentor, Dallas Willard. It was the late 1990s and John was on staff at a mega church called Willow Creek in the Chicago area. Now, even at this time, as John was a well-known speaker and pastor and teacher. So you could assume that he had all this life and leadership stuff figured out. But behind the scenes, by his own admission, John felt like he was being pulled more and more into an ever demanding life. So thankfully, John, he picked up the phone and and he asked for help. He called his mentor, Dallas, and he said, Mr. Willard, what do I do? There was a pause, a little bit of silence on the other end of the phone. And then Dallas said this. He said, John, you must ruthlessly eliminate all hurry from your life. John thought, that's brilliant. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from my life. I can do that. What else? Another pause, some silence. And Dallas said, John, there is nothing else. He said, John, I want to be clear. I want you to know that hurry is the greatest enemy of spiritual life in our day. Think about that. Hurry. Hurry is the greatest enemy of spiritual life in my day. You know, it reminds me, my my grandmother used to tell me, she would say that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy, right? And there's some truth behind that statement. When you think about it in its most simple forms is sin and busyness, both have the same impact on us. Breaks our connection to God, to other people, even our own self. So for the next two weeks is we're gonna look at this idea of living a hurried life. We're going to look to the life and lessons of Jesus and see what he can teach us. But before we begin today's message is I want to make sure that that we have clarity on what we are and on what we're not talking about. 
So today when I'm talking about living a hurried life and I'm talking about busyness, what I'm not talking about is working hard, about being a good leader or being a good boss or a good student. Absolutely not. Scripture is clear. As followers of Christ, we should be some of the best leaders, best employees. Students, you should be some of the best students as you honor your teacher, you honor your classmates, you put your effort toward your schoolwork. So I think today's conversation can best be framed with a question. Let me ask you this. Do you have the time to calmly and effectively with strength and joy, do the things that matter most in your heart and in your home? Do you? Do you have the time to calmly and effectively with strength and joy, do the things that matter most in your heart and in your home? Because friends, that's the essence of living a hurried life is we simply have too much to do. So let's look to the pages of scripture. If you have your Bibles, will you open uh, them with me to Matthew chapter 11? As a reminder, as you can download the Kingsland app, there's a Bible on there. There's faith talks, there's sermon notes, there's easy ways to give, there's resources for your family, but you can download the Kingsland app. Now, kids, I know you're watching today, maybe at your TV or computer, and you're in the living room with your family, and I'm gonna ask you a favor is a couple of times today is I want you to read along with me. And this is one of those. So Matthew chapter 11, we're going to be in verse 28. The words are going to be on the screen. So you ready? Here we go. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want you to notice that first sentence. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There's really three key parts to that sentence. The first is an invitation. Come to me. The second is a description of the present condition of of those Jesus is talking to. He describes those as weary and burdened. And the last is a promise, a promise of hope. I will give you rest. So today I want to look at each portions of that scripture passage as we examine again three reasons why living a hurried life is dangerous. Reason number one is hurry. It redirects our worship. It redirects our worship. Look at those first three words. Come to me. Come to me. That's an invitation from Jesus to us. It's a beg. It's a plea. He's inviting us to him because what he realizes and he wants us to understand is we are not where we are supposed to be. We're somewhere else. He's asking us to come back to him. And Exodus chapter 20 is verse three is we see that God gives the nation of Israel the law, the 10 commandments. And the very first one is clear. God says, have no other gods beside me. A few months ago, as Pastor Ryan, he mentioned that our God has a no compete clause, right? Is our God wants our undivided loyalty and attention and focus? Why? Is it because he's a selfish God? No. It's because he realizes if we redirect our worship somewhere else, it leads to destruction. It leads to false fulfillment. It leads to brokenness. So he asks us to come back to him. You see, but, but here's the problem is, is we live in an American context that values hard work and independence among some of its chief virtues, and they're good. And we also live in a Christian context where we look to passages of scripture like Colossians chapter three, where we see that we should work as unto the Lord. So in reality, our worldview is also reinforced by scripture that says hard work honors God. And it does, friends, it does. But, but what happens when our hard work no longer honors God? What happens when our hard work replaces God? In the 1930s, as economist John Maynard Keynes, as he wrote an article called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, At that time in the 30s, as John was looking at the technological advances of the day and age, and he made a prediction. He said this, 
by the 1980s or really the end of the 20th century is the average American is only going to work about 15 hours a week. Now think about that. Kids, if you're watching at home, here's what that means is you still have to go to school, but your parents have a five day weekend, right? That's pretty good. He said this, for the first time since his creation is man will be faced with this problem, how to occupy his leisure time. And believe it or not, his true story is, is many saw this as a problem. In fact, true story on Capitol Hill in 1967, as there was a Senate subcommittee hearing to address this problem is they predicted by the time we got to the 21st century is that average American would work 22 hours, 22 hours. They thought that the problem of the future would not be too much work. It would be too much free time. So what happened? What happened? Simple answer is our worship was redirected. You could see with the decline of traditional faith in America that many other religions had begun to pop up. Today, you can worship nature. You can worship animals. For many people, they worship their political parties. Others say they worship nothing. But in reality, is we all worship something. And according to two supporting articles in Psychology Today and The Atlantic, is workism, the worship of work, is among the most potent new religions. Can you believe that? Now, kids, do you remember King David? Remember David, the same one who killed Goliath? Well, guess what? David had a son named Solomon. And Solomon followed him and became king and was one of the wisest and richest men of all time. And I want you to listen to what Solomon had to say about this idea of worshiping our work. Listen to his words. For what does a person get with all of his work and all of his efforts that he labors at under the sun? For all his days are filled with grief and his occupation is sorrowful. Even at night, his mind does not rest. Wow. So how did the... the economists of the 21st century, how could they get all this wrong? We don't know why. Is even then, is, is they couldn't imagine how our work would evolve from a simple means of production to a deep means of identification. They couldn't understand and they couldn't predict how work would evolve for no longer just an occupation, but now it's a constant preoccupation. They wouldn't understand how our work desks have now become our new altars. Friends, we were created for work and rest, and we should honor God in how we do both. Our work should glorify God, not replace him. Why is hurry dangerous? Number one is because it redirects our worship. The second reason that hurry is dangerous is because it reinforces our worry. Look again at the passage of scripture of come to me all who are weary and burdened. And we go back to that present condition. Jesus describes the crowd he's looking at then and even today with two words. And I know weary and burdened sound similar, but they also have very unique differences. The word weary, it implies someone almost working so hard or running so fast that their lungs hurt. Why are we weary? because of the pace of our life. Come to me all who are burdened. The word picture here in the Greek of burden is a picture of taking something heavy and placing it on the shoulders of someone else. Why are we burdened? Because of the weight of our life. Come to me all who are weary and burdened. Why are we weary and burdened? Because of the pace of our life the weight of our life, and because we don't rest. You know, before coronavirus, if, if I was to ask you, how are things going at work? How are things with your family? Do you know what you would say? Man, things are so busy, Brad. We're doing this, and you would give me a list. It was almost like busyness had become the new status symbol. It's what we all were. We took pride in it, and it was felt across all generations. One thing I love about Kingsland is on our central campus is we have a preschool that meets during the week called CEC, our Child Enrichment Center. 
And quite often during the week, as I have the opportunity to walk the hallways, and many times as I'll see these kids, as the teachers will be moving them from maybe their classroom to a playground. And sometimes the teachers, they're so patient and kind as they'll allow the kids to chat with me. So I remember one Tuesday in November, I'm walking in the hallway and, I, and a teacher is with her class. And I see a four-year-old girl that I know and she says, hi, Pastor Brad. So I stop and I take a knee and I start talking to her and I say, how are things going? How's your family? She says, we are so busy. I said, okay, you're busy. Well, well, what are you guys doing? Here's what she said. She said, it feels like everything, right? Even our kids feel this, but why? Why are we stumbling over ourselves to prove how busy we are? You wanna know why? is because hurry, it reinforces our worries. If my life is busy, it can't be empty or meaningless. Hurry reinforces that what the questions we have, like, am I good enough? Is God for me? What if I fail? Am I in this alone? But for us, instead of taking those questions to our heavenly father and saying, God, I place these at the foot of your cross. Can you reveal to me who I am? How do you see me? As many times as we take these questions and we give them to the world. And instead of answers, we just get more activity. Hurry reinforces our worry. Scripture talks about this in Psalms 127. Kids, once again, here's what I want you to do is the words are on the screen. So follow along with me. Psalms 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain, you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. He gives sleep to to the ones he loves. That means God gives us rest. Another version that I read says that he gives such things to those even while they sleep. Friends, God is constantly reminding us that we're not the source of our blessings. We're not the source of our fulfillment or our salvation. He is. He simply asks for our cheerful dependence on him. You know, Jesus also understood our inclination to worry in the Sermon on the Mount as he's looking at the crowd and he's looking at his disciples and and he could feel what they're feeling. And he talks about this concept of worry. And I want you to listen to these words in Matthew chapter six. Jesus says this, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, how many things? And all these things will be provided for you. He gives to those he loves even while they sleep. Why is hurry dangerous? Because it redirects our worship and it reinforces our worry. The third reason that hurry is dangerous is because it results in wreckage. In wreckage, I know that's a powerful word, but look again at that present condition of weary and burdened. I think if I ask you, as we all would know the answer, if I said, where does your your weary and your burdens impact you the most? You would know right away. It impacts us in our heart and in our home. That's where hurry causes its damage in our heart and in our home. Now, let me clarify a few things before we talk about this point. I'm not you. I'm not you. And I know some of you, when you hear today's message and we talk about slowing down your life and eliminating some of the busyness and hurry is maybe it convicts you or maybe even bothers you a little bit. And that's good. It did the same thing. I know for me is back in January as a good friend, Chris Sneller and I were at Chick-fil-A on a Friday morning and we were talking about this concept of really just living a hurried life. Because I think within all of us, there's a, there's a natural ache to live a life probably that has a little different speed than the one we're currently in. 
But many times when we hear sermons like this, or we hear people talk about topics like this, is we view them as unrealistic. So we naturally cut the speaker off. So maybe this morning is you're sitting on your couch and you're thinking, he has no idea what it's like to be a single parent and work two jobs. You're right, I don't. Maybe you're thinking, he has no idea what's demanded of someone in my line of work. I might not. He has no idea what it's like to be me. It's probably true. But can you listen to me for just a moment? In my previous line of work and my former profession is I was the guy that took pride of being the first guy in the office and the last guy to go home. In the Marine Corps, that guy gets rewarded. He gets promoted. In fact, I wore it as a badge of honor that I could work longer and harder than any of my peers. But guess what? Regardless of any of our occupation is we know that the price is paid in our heart and in our home. Kids, if you're watching today, is one of the things that I love about scripture is a lot of times when we read about the life of Jesus, we can see that people ask him questions. And I love that. I know many of you, you ask your parents questions and believe me, they love that as well. But what's neat is sometimes Jesus, instead of answering the question, is he'll ask them a question back. Other times he may redirect the answer. Sometimes he answers with a parable, but sometimes he answers with clarity. This is one of those times I want to share with you. In Matthew chapter 22 is Jesus is asked a question, a really important one. What's the greatest commandment? Listen to what he says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, according to Jesus, is the greatest thing we can do during our short temporary time here on earth is to love God and love our neighbors. But friends, here's the deal. Love and hurry are incompatible. They're incompatible. Love is painfully time-consuming. Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. Love is is never in a hurry. Never. You see, one doesn't actually need to, to read scripture to see how hurry wrecks our hearts and our homes. We know it. We've seen it. Yes, we may get a little success. We may get a little promotion. But at what cost? Our health, anxiety, depression, broken relationships, a strange marriage, Distant kids, a neglected God. Friends, I don't know about you, but I'm at my worst when I'm in a hurry. Some of my worst moments have been when I'm in a hurry. I can't love what I say I value the most in a hurry. I can't love God in a hurry. I can't love my wife in a hurry. I can't love my kids in a hurry. In fact, probably like you is I find that when I'm in a hurry is I run past much of what God is trying to show me. When I'm in a hurry, I can't hear the things that he's trying to tell me. You see, because here's what I've learned. Is church, what I'm not saying is don't go after your dreams. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't go after that promotion at work. Yes, you should. Students, you should try hard. You should make good grades. I'm saying don't do that at the cost of your heart and your home because you want to know why? His friends, hurry is a fraud. It's a fraud. Hurry substitutes a shallow frenzy for deep friendships. Hurry feeds my ego, but it starves the inner man. Hurry fills my calendar and fractures my family. Hurry is dangerous because it redirects our worship. It reinforces our worry and it causes wreckage in our heart and in our home. For many of us, is we have a tiredness that's not just in our body, but we feel it in our soul. And I think once again is one benefit from this terrible disaster is just maybe We've been freed from the chains of an overbusy, 
over hurried life. A few weeks ago, as, as I put a question out on Facebook, I just wanted to know, is there, is there any things in your family that you're doing, any habits, any routines that you want to keep when this is all over? And I want to share some answers with you now. Here's what my friend Sterling said. She said, this has been such a sweet time during so much uncertainty. I've gained so much time with my kids that I would have never gotten. I know the busyness will return, but we've talked about making it a priority to have these days where we would still hang out together. Another mom simply said this, we eat dinner together as a family. I've sure missed this. My friend Brooke, she stated, I've been begging God to take some burdens from me that I didn't have the will to say no to on my own. Those burdens have been lifted. A dad emailed me and he said this, this time has allowed me to reprioritize my life. I'm thankful for the opportunity to show my family that they are important. I think one of the most powerful forms of feedback that I got was about a week ago when I was in my neighborhood running and I saw a family that I know that we go to church with and, and I maintained social distance, but we were talking to the family and I asked one of their boys, who was probably eight, nine, 10 years old. I said, how are you doing with all this? And he smiled and said, Pastor Brad, it's great. I love having my dad home. I love having my dad home. Friends, I know that sometime in the weeks and months ahead, that life's gonna slowly begin to go back to normal. And it may be a new normal and that's good. Getting back into that is good. But for us, if we rush back into normal and we, we fill our calendars up and we allow hurry and busyness to gain a foothold in our home again, then we're gonna lose the most important lesson that we've learned during this time. That as a family, we can ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our life. Our God, our hearts, and our home are worth it. You know, there's one portion of that scripture at the end that we're gonna talk about now. We talked about the invitation, the present condition, but there's also the promise where Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Friends, the rest that Jesus is talking about is more than a physical good night's sleep. It's rest for eternity, that we can rest in the actions that Jesus did on the cross on our behalf, that we can rest in him as our savior, that we no longer have to strive for acceptance or identity in things like the world or our work, that we can rest in who we are as sons and daughters of Christ. So as we close today, as I have two challenges for you, the first is this, as you sit there today, maybe in your living room is maybe this eternal rest that we talk about. The rest in Jesus is you've never experienced it. You've heard it talked about, or maybe not. Maybe today is the day that you make a decision to say, Brad, I lay it all down. I'm tired. Not just tired from the things of this world, but I'm tired of carrying burdens that I no longer have to carry. If that's you, I wanna ask you to do one thing. You'll see there's a number at the bottom of your screen. Just pick up your phone, call or text that number. We have some of our pastoral staff that would love to talk with you today. They can open the pages of God's word and share with you the beautiful redemption story of what Jesus has done for you, where your life can be changed for eternity today. The second challenge I have for you is for you as a family, as today, as you sit around your living room, probably like my family, and, and you've got a cup of coffee and, and kids there, you're watching, and you anticipate the day when this new normal comes, I'm gonna ask you to make a commitment to look around the living room, the kitchen, wherever you may be, and say, we're gonna draw a line in the sand. We're gonna keep the things that have meant the most to us during this time. Our family dinners, our time with God, 
our walks, we're not gonna allow hurry to redirect our worship, to reinforce our worry, or to cause wreckage in our hearts and in our homes. Friends, let's pray. God, we love you so much. Lord, we thank you that in the midst of even a a pandemic is we have the ability to open your words and you can speak to us today. So God, yes, this message we shared eight weeks ago, but today it means so much more. And so our prayer, God, is that you would transform lives as only you can. God, that we wouldn't rush back in to making busyness the status quo in our hearts and in our homes we would seek you and your wisdom. So God, would you do that for us today? Let us see things with your eyes, hear things with your ears, and fill things with your heart. In Jesus' name.